kind of, you know, um, we went to sleep last night after having watched the thing, the things happening. Mm -hmm. We woke up this morning and watched them some more. And I just, <laughs> before I fell asleep, was watching various folks' commentaries on the president's talk, um, this moment in time, the, the not red wave, red whisper, whatever. Danya, who is medium fabulous, what's your take on this moment? How are you and what do you see? Um, there are a lot of things, right? I certainly, um, I, you know, there are all these things happening. There were people were expecting this big red wave and this sort of Christo fascist tide. Um, there are all of these dude pundits go, kind of scratching their heads saying, gosh, it's so strange that that didn't happen. And we're trying to figure out why, as though the reversal of a fundamental human and constitutional right that is guaranteed to half of the population earlier this summer would not impact the thinking of and actions of many, many people. And as though the encroaching of Christo-fascism and white supremacist um, everything and the um, very clear threat to our democracy on every single level, uh, as we've been seeing, you know, in the post January 6th and election deniers and all of that, would not all be motivating forces for people to get off their butts and get out. And so, obviously, abortion won basically in all five states all that it was on the ballot, right? We, we, codified the right in California and Vermont and you know Kentucky said no thank you to banning it on in the constitution um this you know another anti-abortion measure like failed in Montana like nobody wants people do not want abortion bans and um and now we have to figure out you know white supremacy is still doing well fun functionally right yeah. What do you think? Still a lot, exactly more, right? Really, I would say, so I'm gonna say you know, three things. One, I'm just gonna say abortion, abortion, abortion. So you and I can come back to that. Because can we actually really believe, can we actually really believe that the court, the Supreme Court of the United States is making policy against justice? I'm just gonna, I wanna make sure I say that. like. The Supreme Court of the United States that ruled in 1967 that I could be married to my white husband, you know, that's nice, that ruled in 1965 for voting rights uh, or supported it, but then has been systemically gutting it, mm -hmm. gutted women's rights to have an abortion and is gutting affirmative action. The Supreme Court is not an impartial third arm of the government. It's a crystal fascist engine of suppression. So saying that, and yeah, thank God, enough of us, no matter our party, felt that we should at least have, let's say, Danya, if it's not a love wave, it's a let's get our act together wave, you know, some kind of wave of this is a bit too much, a bridge too far. Let's go to the polls and, and cut this out. So I, I'm with you there. This morning when I was listening to one of the stations, uh, John Meacham was on saying, you know, basically um, this for him felt like it was the end of the beginning. And I thought that was interesting, the end of the beginning. I'm like, what do you mean? So he was kind of saying, and Bob Woodward was agreeing that what folks thought would happen, that the fascist orange one had caused such a tsunami of white supremacy and crystal fascism that there would be a big red wave and that didn't happen. Danya, that didn't happen. So that makes me feel a way, like a good way, not a, like a perfect way, but like a whoo, right way that there's, I wanna look, talk about where the hope is and how we build coalitions and how we make, make something into that. Right. And I think the third thing really quick, and we'll come back to both, all of these, I hope, is I still feel like the racism and the and the anti-Semitism and just the 
hate women, hate queers, hatredness in our nation blows my mind yep. wide open. Yeah. It just and, blows my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, I don't know. I think about the places where uh, human rights lost. And mm-hmm. I remember that voter suppression has had a really good head start this yes. time. I, I, you know, it, we have been uh, running a defense game since 2012. Right. And, um, and despite suppression, right, despite the gerrymandering, despite every effort by- Don't take water to people standing in line at the polls. I mean, you know, despite all of these things, despite all of the the sneaky tricks, the attempts to you know suppress the basically access for voters of color and and getting polls in you know only one polling place in this massive area and all of those things, still we did so well, and even in you know the the states you know the devastating loss uh, of the governorship in Georgia. Right in, in Texas, right? That we still came so close, even with all of the gerrymandering and all of the suppression. And I think we need to honor that yeah. as well. The snaps to that, I think that's right. And there's people in my room, there are room here, my voters reform group, all kinds of folks who went to the polls, did the storytelling, made the phone calls, you know, wrote the cards, uh, you know, uh, told the stories. So for a nation of activists, and artists and faith leaders, you know, you are like the rabbi to the people, Danya. All of the energy that went into making a wave of, I'm gonna call it a common sense wave, a little teeny tiny baby, baby love wave, I'm thinking, but that I wanna just give snaps to that. I think we don't spend enough time, Danya, in the kind of appreciative inquiry place where we say, look at y'all, we did a good job. We need to, we need to kind of own that a bit. And yeah. also, what the hell, right? <laughs> what the hell? What's <laughs> that too? Because also you're like, are we really having a runoff between Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock? Oh my God, girl, I'm so embarrassed at that. I, I have to say, from my pulpit on Sunday, I was like, because you're black and you can run fast does not make you qualified to be a senator for the United States. It was this amazing sermon I saw, you know, that was circulating yeah. online. So, you know, he's a walker, he's not a runner. <laughs> okay, so let's let's just drop back a minute to the wound uh, to our female bodies. That is the that is the Dobb decision. That is the Roe v. Wade thing. Like, what, Donna? We've both done so much talk about this. And I still think people don't get it. And especially, you know, I've been in spaces where I've actually done it this make you laugh. I'm sometimes in spaces where I am the Jewish person in residence talking about Hebrew scripture, right? And what, I'm like, call a rabbi, but here I am, right? What, why, why did this happen, Danya? And how do you feel about it as a woman who is a mother and a faith leader and a rabbi and a person who is schooled in Hebrew scripture and like this Christo, I want to make sure we say our word, this Christo fascist movement wants to act like it gets to decide what Americans do, no matter what their faith is, no matter what their gender. What right. talk about that song? So um, listen, right. National Council of Jewish Women, this is, uh, abortion justice is one of our major issues. And, um, you know, we we have a network of over 2000 rabbis for repro who mm-hmm. are rabbis who preach, teach, activate, agitate for abortion justice, every single denomination. We've mm-hmm. got, you know, the whole movement going. We've we have a million things happening. And thank it, God. Just, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, like this is this is what we do, and I can say very clearly that abortion bans are not only a violation of everybody's Fourteenth Amendment, right? The right to privacy, which is now they're going after, as you said, you know, they're going after contraception. They're going to go after um, same-sex marriage. They're going to go after Lawrence v. Texas, which you know killed sodomy laws. Like it, they're going to go after Loving um, versus Virginia. Yeah. Um, but it is also a violation of the First Amendment, 
right? Mm -hmm. Because when you make uh, one religion's idea about when life begins into policy, that is, you know, and I can do the whole scriptural song and dance about Judaism and show you where in the Torah and how we read and but da 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 doesn't matter. We think about things differently, but when we try and one theological perspective into law and impose it on other people, you are, you're, you know, you're, it's a violation of church and state. So <laughs> there, you know, there is that, but functionally like the, that is, that's the intellectual piece for yeah. me. The deep piece is that uh, abortion bans are part of white supremacy. They yes. always have been. Yes. The 14th Amendment was part of, it was a reconstructionist amendment that was in part about giving black families autonomy, right? right. And agency. And then, you know, the anti-abortion movement started and really got kickstarted after they lost school segregation. And who is harmed most are, you know, in addition to it's black and brown communities, it's people struggling financially, it's immigrants, it's uh, trans men and non-binary people who are four times more likely to have difficulty accessing abortion care, by the way. Um, it's young people, but it's, you know, it's, it's communities of color who are largely harmed most. And the people who are passing these know that, right? No, they do know it. So Ben, my, my amazing Ben, who's Reverend Ben, is always doing all the great things over there. Ben, that political article that is so right up top, if we Google what's really going on with abortion, y'all, there's an amazing political article that I think really, really, analyzes, puts together, builds the story on how Politico, um, I would Google it when I'm getting ready to talk and then I forgot to, but like the really honors, really honors the the story of how what Danya said is true, that once the South, we sometimes y'all will find it in the kind of Southern strategy, but once the South lost the battle on segregation, literally it was the religious right who decided to Google they didn't have Google, but to figure out, to test what is, I, I always think, I, I always think it's like the Anita Bryant moment, right? Like they were like, hmm, which issue could we say is the issue that will galvanize our people? What will it be? Thank you, Ben. Will it be, hmm, will it be school prayer? No. no, 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 no. Hmm. Will it be pornography? Nope, nope, nope. But it'll be abortion. It'll be dead Fetuses. Innocent souls, right. And, 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 and because, you know, that they, they are, the minute you're born, then we don't care about you and, and you're not going to be like, there's no, there was never in, in this strategy was never, we're going to reduce abortion by comprehensive sex ed, by making it possible for people to have babies because they're going to have, you know, access to okay. food, right? Economic justice. Um, yeah. That's not the point. The point is controlling bodies that are that could be controlled. So I want you all to pick that. Thank you, Ben. Link up and put it in your world because someone's going to say to you, but isn't it really? And it's really not. It really isn't a care about those unborn babies. It really is a care about what issue can be fracturous in a Christo fascism world. And this is what won. Honestly, it won. So Danya. Christo fascism. Let's you and I talk about the unholy alliance between white supremacy and the Christian church. Like, let's just jump all in it with all four of our feet and our four hands and arms. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that together. And, and I'm going to just go first to say, as a Christian pastor, I own this word and I own this issue just so everybody knows you'll notice that I'm not white <clears throat> but I will claim that the Christian church has been fascist since Constantine decides to make Christianity the state religion of the empire when the Judean from Palestine and it's from that, well, look, let's just, just go Judean from Nazareth and Galilee. We don't know what that country was called then, but that man, Jesus, Yeshua, 
that guy, when he was doing a movement, not trying to make any religion, and he was not a Christian, boop, period, boop, 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 was not. But when he was just trying to reform this space in a, let's say, time of oppression, a time of outsiderness, in a time of empire, doing what Donnie and I do, preaching, teaching, like, let's think about it this way. And here comes this movement and the, and the empire decides to hijack it. That's fascism. That's what happens. When we, is it really fascism, Reverend? Yes, it is. When we, the church, decides to bip, bip, bip across Europe and squash anybody who isn't a Christian, torture them. Have you been to those old churches in Europe? They take you on the tour. Down here is where we tortured the Muslims. That's fascism. When we decide that we do not, and we just uh, can't abide people who are not Aryan, we're going to kill, kill them. That, 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 that is fascism when we have a Holocaust, when we decide that we are a primarily black nation, but the five white people get to run it and have apartheid, that's fascism. When we decide to have Jim Crow in this country, this country, that's fascism. When white people take their little babies out on the field and watch the black people get pulled apart because they are black and did something, I don't know, whatever, had sex or breathed, whatever, that's fascism. So Christo-fascism is not new. It is how this nation was built. Anybody want to say amen to that? Amen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Here it is. Thank you. Yeah. So Danya, talk about how that feels from your place in the world. I can't even imagine. Like, but let's try. I, I just, I, you know, I just, as a Jew, it means so much to me to have the reality and the history that I know sort of named and, and validated. There's this, often this kind of gaslighting conversation that I have where there are often many white Christians want to be like, well, they're not real Christians. And I'm like, well, were the people who kicked my family out of Germany were like, were they real Christians? What about the crusaders who like murdered entire, who destroyed entire towns and raped our people? And we decided we'd rather commit suicide than meet the crusaders when they came. Were they real Christians? What about the Inquisition? Were they real Christians? And it's like, you know, every tradition, I mean, listen, uh, you know, the, the, a bunch of Jews just uh, elected Jewish fascists you know, in Israel. And I, I cannot say they're not real Jews. I have to grapple with the fact that somehow those people read the same books that I read and have come up with a horrific, racist, disgusting conclusions that I do not condone, cannot abide, right? But but I, to try to, like, just the naming and the owning of the truth just feels like, you know, ugh. It's it's a it's a validation that I almost never get, and I'm really grateful. So thank you. Um, and and it's been at, yeah, and it's been at the root of our country since the land and yeah. genocide and enslavement that characterized its founding. Right. That's exactly um, right. That's right. And so when we say, when any of us say, when any of us say, this is not who we are. This is precisely who we are. The landed gentry got pissed at the monarch, decided to get on boats, come across the world, quote, discover some stuff that already existed, that already had people on it, and discovered it, blessed by papal bulls, where the Pope was like, go, 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 find some heathens, take the land, right? That is fascism. That is the beginning of our country. When Thomas Jefferson was writing notes on the state of Virginia and telling, telling France, please come, you will live it here. You, you know, the, the Negroes are not as smart as we are. They're not as cute as we are. Their grief is transient. They don't really feel things. Their lovemaking is actually more like writing like animals. It's not really lovemaking. They, 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 they don't know ardor. And by the way, just like dogs and cats, we get to say, are they beautiful or not? We get to say that about black people too. This is your, this is Jefferson. This is it. This is how it was. And so let's not pretend. So Danya, now I'm black. I'm saying that. I'm a Christian pastor saying that. They are Christian. We are Christian. It is our problem. We did it. How does it work on your side of the world? Like, where does it break your soul? Like, you know, because it does break a soul, Beyonce. Like, talk about that. This is crazy yeah. town. I mean, so there's uh, the historical truth and there's the, the this moment truth and they are all deeply intertwined, yeah. right? 
you know, in this moment, I am terrified and furious as a Jew who is seeing, you know, anti-Semitism rising up and seeing the sort of fetish, evangelical fetishism and philo-Semitism that objectifies Jews and wants to ultimately use us as cannon fodder when they take over the Holy Land and, you know, get Armageddon going and Gog and Magog and whatever, right? Wait, pausing right there. Do you all know what Dan is talking about? Because <laughs> progressive Christians oh, sure, yeah. don't need so much okay. to talk about. Wait, just slow it down just a little because okay. progressive church isn't like, Jesus is coming again. But if and it does, so, dies. Yes. <laughs> right. so there is an evangelical movement of Christian Zionism where, and this is not every Christian who happens to, but, 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 this is a, a, this is a movement and it's a lot, there's a lot of them of sort of supporting the state of Israel, mostly supporting its like ugliest, most far right iterations. Um, it's all at the expense of Palestinian lives, dignity, humanity, right? Um, but sort of supporting, supporting, support for Israel, um, and the end game really is because it's whether we, there's, there's the, there are a few versions. There's the white nationalist version of America is a white country and we need to get those Jews out of the white country and send them to the Jewish country, right? There's that version. Then there's the sort of evangelical um Armageddon version where the end game is there's a, supposed to be a war of Gog and Magog that's going to like bring the second coming you know somehow everybody's you know whoever's going to be swept away and Jews are either going to convert which for us we have I'm just like I'm sorry we have 5,000 years of preparing death to conversion we're not gonna like quit now sorry um <laughs> Like, or they will be cannon fodder, right? And Palestinian lives are, and concern for them are always absent from this conversation. But like, basically the Jews and Palestinians are gonna go obliterate each other and Jesus is gonna, I, I don't know, come out of the sea foam and, or, or whatever. I don't know. Out of the sky, out of the sky. Out of the sky. I'm, right. I'm sorry. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, um, it's just always very like, you know, so cartoonish how they're, how it's described. Right. It's, um, and, but anyway, it's, it's like, there's this fetishization of Jewishness, both as a supersessionist thing, right. That is the old covenant, but it's ours now. You guys don't matter anymore, but duh. Right. And that's, you see them taking over, um, like Jewish ritual objects, blowing the shofar, wearing prayer shawl. Like there's that thing. You mean there. like in the like at the Capitol on January sixth, like that? Yeah, and and you know you'll see them in the Republican convention. There'll be always there's always a dude with a shofar now, um, and that's called "You guys don't matter. This stuff is ours now." Uh, and oh, we also taking over the Passover seder's. Christian satyrs are like never mind that Jesus never celebrated a satyr. Like that was that was a post temple thing. <laughs> like isn't that? Um, but this sort of taking over the land of Israel is part of this political end game. And um, it's scary. So there's that, like, there's all of that. Yeah. And then there's the thing about me as a person, like uh, for me personally, as a person with a uterus, like I'm, I'm sort of done with mine. So I don't like, it's not that for me personally, but as a human, but it's more like as a human being, I am seeing, you know, it's like Jews are at risk. Every person of color is at risk. Everybody who is undocumented is at risk. Every trans person, every trans kid is at risk, right? Every queer person is at risk. I'm, I'm queer, you know, whatever. But like, I, I, like they are the this this wave is coming for all of us. everybody. They're coming for all of us, yeah. and we all have to be together in solidarity or you know, or bust, basically. Danya, that, that, you know, that's, that's just it in a nutshell, you know, that's it in a nutshell, you know, you're singing my hymn right there, you know, you're, you're doing my, you're doing my Haggadah, you're doing my, my, my teaching, that's my, that's my Haruta, like, wait, this yes. is it, this is how it is, y'all, and this is how it is, and there's not enough Christians who sort of, yes, we are nauseated, Carla, there's not enough Christian pastors 
there's not enough Christian pastors naming the ridiculousness of this story and the danger of this story. You know, when I was a younger, like when I was Ben's age, ha ha Ben, when I was your age, you know, there was this whole like, you know, all these books and movies and stuff about like, doo, 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 doo. you know, you're going to be driving your car and there's going to be like a suddenly, and like all the people are going to get swept away to the, you know, to, to the rapture, all the good people, the bad people will just, you know, be left here, you know, um, getting hit by the cars that the good people left driving on the road. And the story embedded in that, and I'm, and I'm making fun of it because it should be made fun of, because there's one thing if you read Revelation as a metaphor and try to figure out what this is about, but it's another thing if you make your whole faith life about some BS, you know, killing of people to make God's will happen, and there has to be a big drama, fire, terribleness, battle on Armageddon. What's that Hebrew? Armageddon means what? Yeah, it means it means Megiddo uh, Mountain. I have been there. Yeah. It's a place. Right. Armageddon <laughs> is not a, Armageddon is not a thing. Har Megiddo okay. is a place. It is Megiddo Mountain. I've been there. I bought a t-shirt for a friend who was like, you have to go there and get me a shirt. You know, <laughs> They you have a say it, rabbi because they don't believe me like karma armageddon da, da, da. and so like the big eruption of violence and crap that's supposed to happen because israel right israel's the place where the battle's gonna be bad. and then jesus is gonna come again with a sword and you know you better be ready we were used to sing gospel songs when i was a teenager you you better be ready are you ready you better be ready redemption is nigh all of this violence and chaos that somehow is supposed to be of God. So we created that God, y'all. That's not God. That's the God we create in our own violent image. And, and the danger is how many people don't have any critical distance from these stories, who, whose preachers keep preaching it and who are not that smart. And the people aren't smart enough to ask a question. So now Israel is a tool. Israel is, is a fetishized tool for the white supremacist Christo fascist end game in which, in which, now, Dinah, you check me here because I say this and I think I hope I'm not being offensive, in which the white Christian fascists substitute themselves into the narrative of being chosen. They're chosen. They are the new. Israel, you've heard that. They're chosen. They've been, quote, grafted in. It's their turn. They were destined to manifest their chosenness by going to other lands and conquering the infidel, which would have been my people, by the way, right? And so this is the story, y'all. How stupid is this? This is what it is. At the crux of our national disease is white ness right white supremacy white nationalist white disease of conquering everyone because they're chosen to do so to dominate the world okay my friend laura's like okay <laughs> right now Danya, your incredible book right how do we turn away from this? How do we as a people repent? And are there different repentance strategies for different people? And like, what's the connection between corporate and personal? Go, Danya. <laughs> Take <laughs> Tell me. Um, <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> um, so, right. It, you know, it's it, we are we are gonna be, and 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 this is the thing. If we don't do the work to face the original harms and go back to the root, we're there again and again, right? It just keeps replicating itself, right? From We go from first contact to the trail of tears to wounded knee to DAPL, right? To the Dakota Access Pipeline. We go from enslavement to lynching to redlining to Jim Crow to voter suppression to mass incarceration, right? I, I mean, it's it, it's this. It does to George Floyd. Right. right to do right. and all right. of that and 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 right and every other uh, you know any every unarmed black motorist who ever gets stopped right um it's it's the you know it, it it replicates itself again and again unless we do the work to stop it and we can only do that at the root so right. um How so do we do it what's the root so, so um 
Get the book, y'all. But she's going to So Unrepentance and Repair was written, it, it started out of um, Me Too, um, when people, you know, I realized that people were kind of looking for a pathway. How do we talk about harm done in, you know, harm in public, in the public square? And, you know, do we just send these dudes into the corner and then what, or now, or huh? And I started using my, so Maimonides, 12th century Jewish philosopher, theologian, Torah scholar, physician, a uh, tired man. <laughs> like he, he's got this famous letter where he's like complaining to somebody. He's like, you can't come visit. I'm too busy. Let me tell you about my day. You know, and then it's like, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like yeah. um uh, so he's he's this brilliant masterwork where he, ta he takes a lot of earlier Jewish thinking and kind of rearranges it and puts it in a certain order it, all over. Like the Mishnah Torah is is that writ large, but it, that includes the laws of repentance uh, or Hilchot Tshuva. Um, so Tshuva. Hitler. Say that again, sweetie. Hitler. So, so, so Tshuva is this word that we translate as repentance, but it isn't like the Christian idea of repentance is, has this like, feel bad, feel sorry, if I understand correctly, like in a lot of people's, at least like the lay education version, right. I have not, like not from the like deep theological perspective, but like what a lot of people kind of walk away right. with feel guilty feel ashamed right yeah as opposed to turning around right right and and so chuva means is an, it, it literally means return and so it's come back to your integrity come back to who you're supposed to be come back to your highest self right come back to where you were supposed to be all along and if this language resonates with you like come back to god right come back to connection and right. to do things to to get there it's not about sitting there feeling bad it's about doing stuff and so then then we get into what i read when i read maimonides i see five steps in the repentance process right so the then and then and now this is where i think i believe that these five steps can map onto interpersonal harm they can map onto like, you know, if you call, if, if interpersonal harm is caused, like this is the way to clean up your mess. Um, but also harm in the public square. Also, if a school causes harm or, a, you know, a synagogue or, a, you know, the Boy Scouts or whatever, right? You know, like how an organization can, can repair harm. And I really believe that this is the pathway for national repair. So step one. Name, name the harm, own it, like, like very, very clearly, like, uh, here is what happened, you know, we did the thing, know what I meant, know I'm really a good person, right, and so you have, like, somebody like Dan Harmon, the showrunner for Community, saying, well, I really couldn't have actually done all of this sexual harassment if I had actually respected women, right, you own it, really, like, deeply, um, and in our country, you know, we have this invitation to the confession step this gorgeous powerful invitation to the confession step um called the 1619 project came out not long ago right like here's the truth let's talk about the truth about what our country really is that every single aspect of our country is functionally is 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 stripped is is like you know, um, threaded through with white supremacy, right? That's at the root of of our healthcare, of of our our traffic patterns, of our of, of, of our everything, right? Housing, everything, health, everything, everything. everything. And um, and, and it was like, hi, can we talk about this? And it wasn't the confession step because the confession step has to be from the harm doer, finally reckoning and doing the work and willing to own it. And America said. No, thank you. No, no. We're going to pass a lot of laws, making sure that, in fact, nobody can ever teach real history ever again, right? Um, but that would be the way, right? Like we start to tell the truth about what happens, and then step two is you start to change, right? What needs to happen to become different? So on the individual level, it you know is it like do you need therapy? Do you need to call your sponsor or get into rehab? Do you need to ditch the friends that are the ones that are your springboard for acting horribly? Do you need to um, do some education? Like do you need to 
get on that anti-racism learning track or start learning about trans liberation or whatever, right? Um, if it's an institution, does your policies need to change so that it's impossible for HR to bury the next complaint, right? When people come and say this terrible thing happened, uh, what needs to change? Like, do you need to fire your whole board? I do not know. Um, but something needs to be different because you want to not do it again. And then you get to amends, right? What is the, so if, if the United States wants to actually deal with white supremacy, like starting to change, it's like, what are the laws? What are the policies? If we really want to change what's happening, how do we deal with the fact that all of these institutions and systems are, you know, threaded with white supremacy? And how do we, how do we address that? Like, what are the legal and political systems that we can enact? And then there is amends. How do you close up that hole in the cosmos, right? And in, it's depends. You have to ask the person who was harmed, right? Is it money to them? Is it money to an organization? Are you donating time? Are you whatever? Um, you How do you know? You have to ask them, right? Because different harmed people need different things. And it's, again, you're they're a subject, not an object. You don't make amends at someone, but you need to offer reparations. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? You can't undo the thing that was done, but you can try to sew it up somehow. Right. right? Um, and then the apology. That's because, the revolutionary. Tell me why the apology comes after. Uh, I think that's so important, but tell me why. Because if you do it at the very beginning, mm -hmm. then you're still the harm doer, right? You're still basically the person who did the thing. And you don't totally get why everybody is so mad about it, or you get it and you don't really care because that you know that person's needs weren't so important to you. And you haven't done the deep inner work to figure out what's like why you were capable of hurting another person in that way, right? Um, you haven't done the grappling, you haven't done the changing, and then you haven't done the thing of having to look somebody in the eyes and say, what do you need? And have to hear the answer and have to kind of, you know, there's that like level of like, you start to change and it's like, oh, oh. And then you like ask them what, you know, what do you need? What would be appropriate amends? And they tell you, and it's like, oh. <laughs> you know, it's like the level of getting the seriousness of the thing that happened. And so by the time it's a, you get to step four, it's like this contrite heart is actually wants to communicate that it feels sorrow instead of like your publicist is writing something on the notes app for Instagram, right? Um, and yeah. then, right. And then organically, naturally, of course, you get to step five. Things are so different that you could not possibly do the thing again. And so, so the apology isn't, I'm sorry, it's I'm transformed. Right. And it means so much to me that I'm, I, I feel so much regret about the fact that I hurt you in this way. And, uh, you know, it, it just, it, it, it's, I, it, yeah, you just need to you just need to know how how horrible I feel, right? And and I just wanted to tell you. I don't expect anything of you, but and forgiveness is a different track, right? In Judaism, you don't there is the sentence you need to forgive me so that my repentance work can be complete. It does not exist in Judaism. Totally like forgiveness, the the person who was harmed has their process. The person who is the penitent has their process. Never the twain shall meet. I mean, you you apologize to the person and maybe they forgive you, but um, they don't have to intersect at all. Uh, but like, so, so then we get to these questions, like what, what would it take A, to get America to be willing to own its sins? And B, can we dream about what an America could look like that is so transformed that it doesn't do white supremacy anymore? That it is no longer white supremacist? Could you imagine? I, I, I can. I can. I dream it. I do dream it. You know, Danya, this. You know, I, I. I remember when your book was gonna come out, and I was looking at your 
going to come out in this of your book thinking there is in the zeitgeist this kind of thing that you're talking about that I'm dreaming about um you know this if y'all joined us last today is November 9 is the is the one year birthday of a fierce love and you know Donnie I was just home with my dad who's 88 years old on November 1st and when I went home last year I gave him my little book and I then went away. Like I, I had speaking gigs. I'm like, here, Dad, bye. <clears throat> he does not really love reading, frankly. <clears throat> and he says again, two days ago, I read your book cover to cover. And Danya, I tell my dad's business and I tell my business in this book. And I talk about harm he did to me to all of us, but it's my book. So I'm not trying to talk about siblings and stuff. But as a black man from Mississippi, traumatized man from Mississippi, poor black man from Mississippi, fatherless man from Mississippi, and, and excuse me, hon, whose anger was his blanket. I am just going to wrap myself in my anger and protect myself in my comfy, snuggly, hoodie anger <laughs> you know like here I am right he hurt us because hurt people hurt people he hurt me because hurt people hurt people and I was his precious shiny special darling child but he still hurt me if I disappointed him right he just hurt my feelings he was mean broke my soul some days and I tell the story of the like say 18th time that I confronted him you know, and it was after a, I graduated with my little PhD and I was feeling all shiny and sparkly and he was at my party and he was just stank. You know, the word, he was just stank. And he really hurt my feelings. And that was the day at 44, Danya, after like other 18 tries where I said, no, daddy, this is not how we're going to do. And said, black child raised with the yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. Like we are not sassy. If you cannot be different, I can't do us. I can't, I won't. I will see you at your funeral. You won't know I'm there, but I'll be doing it because mommy will ask me and that's that. And Danya, that confrontation, that truth telling, that honest, radical, courageous shaking in my boots, truth telling changed my life, changed my life and changed our relationship and changed me, changed me as a human. Like, it's like, wow, you know? And, and he made amends by, by like deeply changing himself with me, like he did. So I'm wanting to say, we don't get, like your book is so powerful and the truth sets us free. The truth, the truth of what whiteness does, the truth of what an angry black dad can do, right? The truth of what Christianity has done, the truth of what sexism does, the truth of what white nationalist crystal fascism does. We got to put the truth out so we can get this moving too, right? This process requires candor and it does change things and it's hard. It's hard. So maybe I just wanted to ask you, What's, I mean, we know who reads your book. What's a formative story for you, Donnie, that sort of goes, yeah, yeah, this is how I know this to be true. Like, do you, can you tell us a, this is how I know it to be true type of story? About the work of repentance? <laughs> oh, so many. Or yelling at old black men, whichever one you want to do. <laughs> yeah, no, I've got, you know, um, It's funny, I made the decision not to put any of my own stories in the book because it's like either I tell a, a story where I didn't do the work quite well and then it's like, well, so that means the theory doesn't work or <laughs> um, or I look sanctimonious or something, I don't know. But um, this is a true thing that happened during the writing of the book. So, um, I, Maimonides has, there's a line in Maimonides that says um, that if a person, so 
it is praiseworthy to do the confession in public normally, right? Because that's, you know, you're asking for accountability from your community. It's an end to the gaslighting for the victim, right? It's whoever didn't believe the victim now will believe, right? Praiseworthy, but not required. But if the victim is dead, you are required to bring 10 people to the grave and to do your confession at the grave um, and to ask forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And I kept circling around that passage while it was working. And it was like the very early days of the pandemic. And at some point I was like, oh God, I'm gonna have to do this, aren't I? Oh no, <laughs> oh no. And um, finally I like sent the email and I emailed 10 of my people who are Jewish and not related to me. So according to Jewish law, they are like kosher witnesses. Um, Cause I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this correctly, right? And I was like, okay, well we can't, actually fly to New Jersey because we are all in the middle of a pandemic and it's not feasible. And I, I was having health issues anyway and whatever zoom, like zoom will work. Zoom is going to, going to count. And I sort of was like, okay, you guys, I, I have to do this thing. Okay. Everybody, you know, everybody was of course happy to show up and we got on zoom and there was, um, uh, you know, a story that I had always held as my greatest regret and my greatest source of shame. And I told a few people over time, but it was um, like still a secret, like it was still classified as a secret that I would share, but it's a secret. And I gathered my people and I told them about how when my mother was dying of cancer, when I was um, 20, uh, she died like four days after my 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. um, so my mom, uh, the cancer got really, you know, I came home for winter break and it was like time to set up hospice. Mm -hmm. um, and my brother and I were running hospice. I was 20 and he was 24 and we were children and we didn't know what we were doing. And, um, you know, my parents were divorced and it was kind of, it was just us. And um, it was scary. And the, you know, <laughs> the little, some nights when things went wrong with the medications or she was in pain and we didn't, you know, it was like the call, emergency calls to the emergency nurse and what do we do and all of that. And then there was a night that we um, had to call an ambulance you know, the emergency nurse said, call the ambulance. And we went and we took her to the hospital. And this is like terrifying hair. You know, I could kind of describe this, like all of the things that happened, but it was a really scary night for all three of us, my brother and my mom and me. And um, then she got settled in her room and it was New Year's Eve. And my brother and I had had, had plans to go out and, you know, a friend of my mom was going to come over. And my mom looked at us and said, you should go out. Mm -hmm. And my greatest regret forever and ever is that I went and that I left her alone in scared after this horrible evening in this hotel, in this hospital room that night. Mm -hmm. And I carried that with me for decades. I'm 47 now. Um, and... Um, you know, she, she died a couple months later. It wasn't like I lost her that night, but, um, it was, you know, I just was like, I should not have left her. I just, I just shouldn't. Have. And I gathered my people and I told the story and, you know, I just shone the light on this dark thing. And as it happened, they, you know, there were some different, you know, people said, well, you know, maybe this was your mother's last way of getting to mother you. And maybe this was her last way of getting to have some time alone. And she wanted to have some space and maybe, you know, maybe it was this and maybe she was experiencing that or we will never know. And I, you know, it, it is what it is. And I, I can, you know, everybody like whether or not I am too hard on myself, that's my own business, but it was just the act of releasing, right? And 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 the 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 and doing it 
according to the direct according to directions right the directions on the box um and um i let it go you know and it's i'm not holding that thing anymore it just um and you know it's like forgiven not forgiven is not the issue right forgiveness and repentance are different tracks but the ways that I, it was holding me down yeah. got let go and i got to move forward into the transformation into somebody different finally yes yes danya thank you for telling us that thank you for bringing us inside your minion i don't know if you <laughs> um you know i i love the way you say the repentance and the forgiveness are not the same track and, and I think in the kind of magical theologies that we create, you know, we kind of were like, this depends on this, right? You, you, you can't forgive someone unless they say they're sorry. <laughs> and also you aren't forgiven unless someone tells you, like none of that's true. There's this place of really beautiful soul work that is just about doing the thing, like telling the truth telling the truth and making amends. And I really think that's so powerful in your book and in your writing and your work in the world. So, you know, I'm selfish and I could tell people there's four more minutes, ask a question, but no, I, <laughs> not, no, no, read our book and then let's do it again. Um, I, I wanna ask you if it's okay as, as we wrap for you to give us just like a, a Danya minute of, you know, it's November 9th in the evening and returns are still coming in and we don't know what's going to really fully happen. What's your, what's your hope that repentance, repair, what's your hope that this concepts that you write about might do something for the soul of America? Can you give us a, a minute and then I'll give mine and we'll close. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I wrote this book because I really believe with everything I have in these ideas and I pray that more and more people will be willing to face down what is there and do the work of accountability in their families, in their communities, in their institutions, mm -hmm. and that that can give them the, um, the muscles, right? That that can help them build the, the capacity for mm -hmm. us to be able to do the real work of transformation and repair that this country so desperately needs. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever the, the returns are, Whatever happens ultimately with midterms, we will have work to do, right? Uh, if uh, if we get the Senate and, and the House, we keep fighting for justice for everybody. And if we lose the Senate and the House, we keep fighting for justice for everybody. So um, we have to take, take responsibility for our harms. We need to push for accountability when, um, when it's not us. And we keep fighting until everybody's safe and free yeah oh my god girl from your heart <laughs> to god's lips um yeah i don't know why i felt that we were gonna do a a b on that <laughs> i mean i just think it's right there for me too wonderful wonderful danya that honestly love I, I i actually can't bear it i i can't bear it i can't bear living not imagining that we know how to fix it i'm pretty resilient i'm pretty up you know hopeful kind of chick and i when i if i sit down and think wow this just is so sucky terrible and and if i if i stopped there if i didn't have an and if I didn't have an and, good people of moral courage and rule-breaking kindness will absolutely not surrender into the dark night of the soul. 
for the bleak night of the soul, because I'm dark and I like being dark, but you know, like to the bleak night of the soul, like we will not, we will not surrender into the horror. We will not, we will not take it. We can't take it. We know there's more and we know that there's work to do and we know we know how to do it. And for me, at the root of that is this kind of fierce love that is so like willing to, to face my mama thing or my daddy thing or my white thing or my black thing or my, you know, like the worst thing to just look at it in the face and dis and disrobe it of power because we say, this is not my best me and tomorrow I'm gonna do better. Yeah. I, I, and, and Danita's writing, what if the white supremacists can't bear it? They, they have to have space to say it, Danita. They have to be able to go, I'm a fucking white supremacist and I'm sorry, really. Excuse my language, but right? We gotta make it's sure. doable. Right. Did, it is doable. We have a story in the book about somebody who did exactly that. You get possible. Absolutely possible. Even Absolutely that possible. bridge can be crossed. And and if we say to ourselves, y'all, being human is giving each other the bridge. That just just I'm willing. I'm willing to watch you do better. I'm just gonna bear witness to it. I'm gonna bring my two three people right. Um, what do we offer them to get them to the bridge? Absolutely fresh starts. Absolutely fresh starts. That's our job. My job to repent is to stop keeping someone imprisoned where they are in my mind. Does that make sense, Dinah? That's my job. Can I release you in my mind to be you better? What, what do you think, Dinah? How would you, yeah. what would you, you say about that? You, you know, if somebody is going to show up and it looks like they're going to be willing to take a step, you say, great, come on. <laughs> right. Yeah. None of that, you know, come on yeah. over here. And, and that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't mean we don't have, um, uh, you know, our the, the whole story in the book. Like it's, you, you have to say no to what is unacceptable and make room for the yeses, right? And that I will not be in relationship with you if this is how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. That gives him room to change because mm -hmm. he wants to be in a relationship. So Danya and I are going to need to do a part two because we promised an hour. Danya, we're on the way to February where some fierce love can be talked. And we're on the way to all of our seasons of repentance and repair and all the things. So please talk to me again. Mm -hmm. I want to say this to you, Danya. I, I know you know this is true. How many lives you impact with your fresh, beautiful, brilliant self. And, and you impact mine. I read you, I listen to you, and I learn so much. And I'm changed <laughs> for good. So Ben is gonna play this song as a benediction to you, particularly Tanya, my rabbi, and to all of us a gift from us to you, you, Danya, and every person who is honest enough to say, this sucks, stop, so that we all have a chance to be better. This is a little wicked song on which we'll end. Thank you, Danya. Thank you. said that people come into our lives for a reason bringing something we must learn and we are led to those that help us most to grow if we let them and we help them in return
it well may be that we will never meet again in this lifetime so let me say before we part so much of me is made of what I've learned from you you'll be with me like a handprint on my heart and now whatever way our stories end I know you have rewritten mine by being my friend like a ship pulled from its Like a sea trapped by a sky bird in a distant world Who can say if I've been changed for the better But because I knew you Because I knew you I haven't changed for good And just to The things I've done you blame me for But then I guess we know there's blame to share And, and none, none of it seems to matter so so much i'm adore you i adore it's you wonderful. it's very lovely thank you all for coming please follow us both in the world and listen all we've got is fresh starts yep let's go get one <laughs> <laughs> yep danya awesome ben i love that you hold these spaces with me thank you so much my friend thanks everybody thank you